performance day is going to be coming out of Luke 13. So if you do plan on following along in the scripture, you might want to go ahead and get your Bibles out and start turning over to the 13th chapter of Luke. Now, uh, we're, we're going to go, go ahead and get to that in just a second, but while, while people are turning in their Bibles, I want to throw in this, this I'm just going to offer this, this little factoid real quick, quick. And, and it seems random, and it's coming, coming out of nowhere, but it's going to help, uh, it's going to help me to go ahead and get this now, so later on in the sermon, as I'm building up, and I'm working towards a point, I don't have to stop and, and get sidetracked. So this, so this little factoid is that every now and then when you're reading in your New Testament, you might hear this expression, the law and the prophets. And what that essentially means is the Bible, at least the Bible as the people of Jesus' time would have known it, the Hebrew Bible, pretty much equivalent to what we call the Old Testament. Sometimes in those days they would refer to the Scripture as the law and the prophets. All right, so that's going to... Uh, hopefully, hopefully make, make something, something I say a little later, later in the sermon, sermon make, make a little, little bit more sense. sense. But, but now we'll, uh, we'll, we'll turn, turn over to our scripture. scripture. So, so Luke, Luke 13, and we're going to start at the 10th verse of Luke, Luke 13. I guess I better, I better turn, turn over there. there. Luke, Luke chapter 13, 13 verses 10, 10 through... Uh, let's, let's say 10, 10 through 17. 17. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And, and not, not, not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Amen. You know, it's kind of hard to argue with Jesus' logic in this passage. This, this woman, woman has been, been bound up by her affliction for 18 long years. Why should she not be unbound on the Sabbath? After all, you unbind your household animals on the Sabbath to lead them to water. So why shouldn't this woman be unbound? Pretty good line of argument there coming from, from Jesus. And coming from God's loving, reconciling, self-revelation who told us to inherit eternal life, we must love God and our neighbors as ourselves. We are shown what I hope is obvious to us at this point, and that is the value that Jesus places on, on human beings. The needs of this woman, they take precedence even over religious observances like the Sabbath. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I need to practice what I preach. I mentioned in last time that we should be careful about speaking Christianese in case there's anybody who doesn't speak the language. Sabbath is just a, a day that we set aside to take, a, take rest from our work. It's a tradition that goes, goes way back in the, in the Judeo-Christian Christian tradition. So that's what Sabbath is. And it was, uh, it was pretty legalistically observed in Jesus' time. And, and so, when I consider what happens in this passage, I have to bring up this old axiom, and I've mentioned it in my preaching several times before, and, and, and the axiom is that if something's repeated, it's important. And the, this is actually uh, one of four different stories, just in the Gospel of Luke, that are almost exactly the same as, as this, this one, one we just, just read. There's four, four stories, stories that are extremely similar to this. The, the first, first one goes back to, um, to Luke, Luke chapter 6, 
when, when Jesus is questioned, questioned because some of his disciples are picking heads of grain uh, on, on the Sabbath. Sabbath. Now, now they're, they're picking heads enough for them, them to eat just to satisfy their hunger, but that, that was considered harvesting to, to, to the, the people that were watching, and they asked Jesus why they were doing that. That's not lawful for them to do. And, and Jesus, Jesus tells them that, that the Son of, of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Sabbath. And, then and then right, right after that, that, Jesus heals a man, man who has a withered, withered hand while in a synagogue, synagogue on the Sabbath. And uh, uh, that, that, of course, upsets some, some of the, the scribes and some of the religious teachers that are there. there. And um, they, they, they want, want to know, you know why, why Jesus did that. that. Why, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Sabbath? And, and his response is so good, and this is one I quote a lot. He says, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save, save life, life or, or destroy it. And, and I, think I think that, that is a, 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 a really powerful, powerful uh, response that Jesus gives. And it's going to really help me make like, like my, my big, big point, point that, that I want everybody to take away from this sermon today. today. Because, you know, I asked one, one of the in seminary how many points a good sermon, sermon should have. And he, and he said, said, well, I ought to have at least one. one. <laughs> then, then our, our passage, passage for today, today uh, you know, you know is the, the third, third such story. story. So, so there's, there's three stories of Jesus being questioned, questioned about the Sabbath. Sabbath. And, then and then the fourth one comes in the following chapter, Luke 14. Um, very, very similar again. Jesus, Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath, Sabbath and is questioned about it. And he says, if, if one, one of you has a child or an ox that's fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? Now, now, I don't, I don't know why it is that all of these stories in, in, in Luke have to do with observance of the Sabbath in, in particular. It seems, it seems a little bit weird. weird. I, guess I guess maybe that was just a big deal in Jesus' time. Maybe there was some controversy um, going on within uh, the Jewish world of that time over Sabbath that maybe wasn't directly related to Jesus' ministry. And, and I'm, I'm just not, not aware, aware of it. Maybe I didn't do enough research, research or something. But, but I, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know why that, that the, the, the Sabbath, Sabbath in particular is such a, such a, such a big, big deal, deal in these stories. But, but in, in either case, case what, what emerges here, here is that, that Jesus puts, puts people first. first. Period. Period. Jesus, Jesus puts, puts people, people first, even ahead of religious observances. observances. Now, now I'm, I'm, I might refer, refer to religion or talk, talk about religious observances uh, throughout the sermon, sermon this morning. And uh, I, I want to be clear what I mean by that, because sometimes language can be very imprecise, and I might say one, one word meaning a particular thing, and it's being heard in a different way. And so, and so we need to clear that up. When I talk, talk when, when, so in, today, today in the context of the sermon, when I refer to religion, I'm not, I'm not just talking about like, like the, the Christian, Christian faith or, or the Jewish, Jewish faith or, or spirituality in general sense. But, but I'm, I'm referring more to um, very specifically the institutional and doctrinal and ritualistic aspects of those things. That's, That's what, what I, mean I mean by religion. And so again, what, what emerges from our scripture today and the several others that I kind of referred to briefly there is that, that Jesus first... Even, Even before religion. religion. And um, we, we see this in, 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 in several stories where, where, where Jesus is confronted by people who have their priorities out of order. They, they are, are putting, putting religion before people. people. But, but we, we would, would never do something like that, that would we? Uh, I was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded, reminded of something that the, uh, the Danish, Danish philosopher and theologian Søren Kierkegaard wrote. He was, he was discussing the Protestant Reformation. You maybe heard, heard of it. It, it was, was a pretty big, big thing that happened in, in, in history. And, and one, one of the big triumphs of the Protestant Reformation was that, that kind of coinciding with the invention of the printing press, it's, it's for the, the first, first time... Um, the, the Bible being translated into the language of the people and widely distributed. This is the first time in history that the, 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 the Bible became kind of widely available to the people. And that was a big deal because, you know, at that time, the Catholic Church in the Western world was a church. There was no um, like, like there, there were no, no denominations the way we think of them today. The church in the Western world was the Catholic Church. And, and they, they had, had this, this, this 
this, this rule that, that the only language the scripture could be uh, translated into was Latin. Latin. And, the and the problem with that was that, was that people, people didn't speak Latin. Latin. The, only the only people who spoke Latin, Latin were, were priests and clerics. And, and so that, that people, people, people didn't, didn't read, couldn't, couldn't read the Bible. Bible. In those, in those days. days. And, and so, uh, you know, you know the, and, and the, the church, church at the time did have some pretty exploitative and pretty corrupt, corrupt practices. And, and so getting the scripture into the hands of the masses was probably a good, a good thing, thing for the for most, most part. part. But, but Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard he, he wondered if there, there might not have been a downside to this. He worried that, that, that Christian had become, a, quote, a religion of learning and law, a mere distraction. He, he, he lamented, lamented that, that, and, and this, this is how he said it, that, that no one any longer reads the Bible humanly. He worried that this, this post-Reformation approach to the Bible would become, quote, a fortification of excuses and escapes. For there is always something one has to look into, first of all. And it always seems to know when at first to have all doctrine in perfect form before one can begin to live. That, that is to say, one, one never, never begins. begins. Now, now, I don't, I don't know, know if you've read, read any philosophy or theology, theology but, but sometimes, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to understand what in the world philosophers and theologians are talking about. about. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder if they even know. know. <laughs> when, <laughs> when I read you know, philosophy and theology, I, I sometimes wonder, does, does this just, just not make sense, sense or am I just, just not getting, getting it? it? And, and I think sometimes the answer is it just doesn't make sense. But, 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 but I, I do think, think that Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard's words, words here are pretty thought-provoking. So here's, here's, here's what, what I take, take away from them, or at, or at least this is kind of where my mind goes as I, as I ponder some of his writing. We, we see consistently that, that Jesus puts people, puts people first, even before religion. religion. And, and if that's, that's what Jesus did, we should take a lesson from, from that. that. And, and so Bible, Bible study is great, and knowing what it is is great, and, and the church working to get its doctrines right is fine. Seeking to understand the church's doctrines is fine, and abiding by those doctrines is fine, and religious observances are great, and so on. But if all of that doesn't lead to loving our neighbors, then, then what, what, what is, is the point, point of all of it? If, if we, we do all of those things, if we pour all of our time and energy or lots of our time into them, and, and it doesn't make us better or more loving followers of Jesus, then why are we really doing all of those things? If all of those things take precedence over the lives of people and caring for the lives of those so precious to God, then we've got our priorities out of order. Because, because we, we see clearly, clearly throughout the gospel tradition that Jesus puts people first. So, so we, we can plumb the depths of scripture, seeking to understand it all and seeking precepts and laws to live by. But, but at the same time, let's, let's not forget that, that Jesus already summed all of that up for us pretty concisely. In the, the gospel of Matthew, I know we're in a series in Luke, but I'm going to borrow from the gospel for a minute here. here. Jesus says, and everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Luke would say that on the commandment to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, hang all the law and prophets. So we can plumb the depths of the scripture, but Jesus summed it up for us. Those two commandments, to love God and love, love neighbor, neighbor, excuse me, precede and proceed. That is, they come before and they are what comes out of Scripture. And that should be the basis of our religion. Now, I do hope that my message is coming across clearly here, because I don't want to have to feel the call from the conference superintendent and have, and have to explain, explain myself. I'm, I'm not discouraging Bible study or claiming that the doctrines of the church or its observances and, 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 and its rituals and so forth aren't important. In fact, I, uh, I derive a lot, of, a lot of meaning from all of those things. But I'm saying that those things shouldn't be an end, an end unto themselves. 
they, they should, should be a means, means to an end. end. And, and that, that end is a community in Jesus Christ bound to one another and bound to Jesus in the, the, the Eucharist or communion that we take together. That, like Jesus, puts people, people first. Those, Those things should all result in reminding ourselves and alerting others to the, the universal reign of God in Jesus Christ. Good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor. The Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray not only with our voices, but with our hands and our feet and our wallets. That's what our religion should be and service to. Of course, I've, I've committed, committed to, to, to offering some ideas of, of how we can grow in our faith each week. Each week. And, and I've been, been encouraging, uh, and, and Jenny shared, shared some testimony with us today, and, and, and the, the week after our society meeting, I was going I was to open things up and, and try to get, get some, some, some other testimonies based, based on that. that. But, but I've, I've been encouraging us to set our intentions every week. week. I will bless one person this week. I will do something to add strength to somebody's arm this week. An encouraging note, note, a phone call, help, help with a need, just something that will lift them up. And then I, want I want to go, go beyond, beyond that. Can we, we bless, bless two people each week? One, one person who's part of our, our, our circle of friends and family and maybe, maybe one who isn't. isn't. I've, I've said, said it would be great um, that, that if we could do that to the point that, that it just becomes second, second nature to us. Maybe it already is for some of us. That, that, would, that, that would be great. I, I want, want to create a, a culture of blessing. I want, I want us to ensure that the lives of people are a priority in our lives. That that's, that's just, just part of who we are. That's, that's just, just in our, our DNA. DNA. And that's, and that's why, again, when, we, when, we, when I started, started saying, saying let's, let's, let's do this, let's, 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 let's work, work on ways that we can grow in our faith, besides just church on Sunday morning. That's why I didn't start with, with a Bible, Bible study, study or something, something like that. that. We'll, we'll get, get there eventually, but, but I started, started with this culture, culture of blessing, blessing because, because Jesus puts, puts people, people first. Jesus puts, puts people, people first, period. period. Another, Another thing, thing that is on my mind, mind and, and our, our scripture, scripture for today, it, it might, might not be the, 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 the best one to, one to illustrate this, Fine, because this, this is something that we still find numerous times um, throughout the gospel tradition. Like, like when uh, Jesus' disciples are questioned about why, why does Jesus eat with sinners and tax collectors? There are a lot of times where Jesus encounters people like sinners and tax collectors that other people uh, simply want to slap a label on. That like, like, like a, a label like, like sinner. sinner. So, so Jesus encounters these, these people, others, others want to slap labels, labels on them and condemn them. them. <laughs> I, I chuckled about this because uh, Gretchen, Gretchen was kind of, I, I, was, I was putting the finishing, finishing touches, touches on this sermon, sermon and Gretchen, Gretchen was sitting by me. me and and um, I said, am I really going to quote Kierkegaard twice in one sermon? sermon? Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I am actually. actually. Uh, Kierkegaard is famously quoted saying, Gate me. Once you label somebody, and in your mind, and the minds of others who, who apply that label as well, that's, that's all that person is, is that, that label. label. That's, that's all they can be. That's, that's all they, that, that you look, look at them. them. When, when you, you label somebody, you negate, negate them. them. So, so don't, don't do that. that. When, when the, the people, people looked, labeled, and condemned, Jesus didn't do that. He looked and saw a person fearfully and wonderfully made in God's own image, loved by God, and so he treated them accordingly. He loved them. He put them in their needs first. Jesus ignored the labels that had been placed on those people. He put, he put them even ahead of religion, and when, when he, he did, he changed, changed lives. 
I think about how, what, what, what like, like little, little ways can we apply, apply that, that even here locally in this church. And, and I, I guess, guess where, where my mind goes, and, and I'll explain, explain why this is on my mind, mind in just a minute, but should, should we find somebody among us? us? Maybe, Maybe we, we don't, don't like, like the way they, they look. We don't like the way they wear their hair. hair. We don't like the way they dress. Maybe we don't like the way they smell. Maybe we recognize them from, from something, something else. We, we, we think, think we know who they are, right? right? We, we, don't, don't, we don't agree with some aspect of their lifestyle we can, can, for something they did in the past. Their, their hairstyle, their clothes, their, their lifestyle, their, their past, that, that might be what you see. But, but remember, Jesus sees a person fearfully and wonderfully created in his own image and loved by God. Jesus sees that instead of labels. Jesus sees that and chooses not to condemn. Jesus puts people first. And so let's take a lesson from our Savior. To greet such a person as I just described with warmth and hospitality, to share kindness with them could go a long way. A kind word from you to that person, you never know. It could be the first time someone's ever spoken a kind word to that person in their life. Love, Love like that can change people. We, we see that, that happening throughout the gospel tradition. I read, I read a book recently on the topic of poverty in America. That's probably why this is on. And, when, and in that book, the, the people writing it, uh, a, a lot of the research they conducted involved interviewing people um, who were experiencing poverty. And, and, and they, they interviewed such a woman, woman who lived in a, a rural part of the country. Asked about, you know, well, what are our churches in, 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 in the area doing to alleviate some of these problems? And she said, well, the church folks around here are all hypocrites. And all they want to do is judge people. And I, I have an issue because I hear stories like that far too often. Now, we here at Mooresville Free Methodists, we can't necessarily take responsibility for, for something that some church did in some other place. But we, we can do our part, though, by speaking up and by doing better. Jesus put people first, period. And so when people talk about this church... They, they should say, the, ch the church, church folks, folks around here are so welcoming. All they, they want to do is love people. people. Amen? Amen? All right, let's, let's pray. pray. I'd like, like to, to offer as our closing prayer today this, uh, this prayer of St. Francis's. Francis's. Lord, Lord, make, make me... me Make of your peace. Where there is hate, let us so love. Where there is pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be, to, to, be, to, to understand, to be loved as to love. For giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen.